I have to admit, I'm quite amazed for gathering such a big crowd, given that we have a, well, relatively big person speaking. In yeah, th don't advertise that, no, because okay. then they will all leave. Yeah, okay. Maybe they just didn't see that. <laughs> or maybe they don't care about politics. Might also be. Yeah. I mean, quick after elections and everything. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so. anyway, uh, good morning, everyone. And welcome to our little story about escaping legacy hell. And I think since you're here, you probably already have enough experience with that and you all have a clear image in your head like what legacy hell means for you. <laughs> yeah, we're going to see if that's the same picture we have, but chances are it's not that different. Yeah. Okay. Um, um, I'm a bit in the way. Yeah, actually, we are standing in the, the wrong Again, order, yeah, we do that every time. So I'm the other guy on the other side of the slide. <laughs> I'm part of a consulting company called the PHPCC. We run around in the world and tell people how to make maintainable software, help teams in managing their software and their infrastructure, and just support them in any way possible, as long as it's somehow related to PHP which obviously might be scary for people not doing PHP in this room, but all this talk is about a concept, so it's not about PHP in general. Of course, it will apply to PHP as in it would apply to every other language. Yeah, um, Yeah. so I'm Sebastian, and I'm one of uh, two developer advocates at the Kartenmacherei, and you may or may not know that company, <laughs> but uh, we use it as an example for what we tell you um, in the next 30 minutes. Um, not really because of advertisement, but because it's easier to understand like how we did it like in practical use and that it's really a real world example. So just some very brief um, background information. So essentially Kartenmacherei is an e-commerce site where you can design your own cards and customize them for weddings or birth announcements or invitations. Um, but like for the sake of this, um, talk, it's really mostly about this is an e-commerce site, as you would expect it. So you have navigation pages, you have products that you can watch, and um, you can put them in the basket and buy them eventually. And uh, this company was founded a couple of years ago, and it started as a family business, like really small, and it grew pretty quickly, uh, which is a good thing. But in terms of the software that powers this company, that brings a lot of issues, and um, if you start small, you start with a, well, either very small prototype thing of software, or you start with something existing. And um, in this case, we started with a well, standard e-commerce software, um, which did its job pretty well in the first years, but now that we grow more and more, it cannot really keep up with the pace. So, we start off with having this nice monolithic e-commerce application that does like everything for us. So all our core processes are somehow shown in this one software and it, it does like everything. Um, now the thing is with monolithic software, especially when it's growing older, it becomes more and more difficult to add new features and we probably all experienced that already. And one of the issues that leads to this is that you probably don't have any real code ownership anymore because especially with like small companies, there's maybe one developer or maybe a team of two that did all the initial work to like build up the business and, and make it run, but they are not in the company anymore. They have left a while ago and the new development team really doesn't have a clue how the old software works, why it was written that way and nobody really wants to take like responsibility and, and really own that code. Actually understandable, if I didn't write it and there's hardly any documentation, it's really hard to figure out why certain things work the way they do. Yeah. So, I mean, we probably all have enough reasons in our head why this old monolith is not a good thing and um, we need to change something. And the first thing that probably comes to mind is, okay, well, we need to get rid of it, so we need a new software. Yeah, let's just rewrite it from scratch. I mean, it cannot be that hard to do that. I mean, it works right now. It's the e-commerce side. I mean, that's a standard problem, so it has been solved various times. So 
well, let's just go for it, right? <laughs> yeah, but I mean, unfortunately, um, since it is this huge software, it does all those different things. It's not just showing products to the customer and doing a checkout. It's also a lot of backend processes, right? The old order, order management and uh, there's so much stuff going on there. I, I can't even like make a list of that. So it turns out that would be a huge project. And nobody would really be able to make a valid estimation on how long that might take. Like a year, maybe one and a half, two years, we don't know. And we don't know because we don't really know what the requirements would be. I mean, there's this typical thing saying, okay, let's just do it like the old software does, right? So we want a new software that does exactly what the old does, but better. The interesting thing about that is that Actually, nobody knows what the original software is doing. I mean, you can see certain things happening, but if you look at the code, you might wonder, why does this actually work? And why didn't it fail earlier? And is that actually what we want to keep doing? So yeah. requirements is an interesting topic. And if you want to go the onward route, you will need to become a software archaeologist because you have to drill into the code and really like read through it, jump from class to class to figure out what the heck it does and if that really is the way it should behave. The scary part about that is, is that if you look at it, you actually have to re-implement the bugs as well because chances are that somebody wrote another piece of software in that monolithic thing somewhere that is based on that broken behavior. So if you actually fix it, it might not actually work anymore. Yeah, it, it starts to sound really weird to do this now. Um, also, if you focus on the existing software, when you write something new, you will end up doing pretty much the same thing because you, it's, it's very hard to think outside the box then because you look at the behavior of the current software and you will somehow end up re-implementing it. And you will most likely not challenge like all the things it does and all the processes that are around that. And there's one more thing that can really kill your business. If it's like this huge project and you start a rewrite um, or start a project with a new software and it's a long-term project, your company is probably blocked because it will be really tough to implement new features or react to changes on the market while you have to maintain your current system and parallelly building a completely new system. So if you want to do a new feature, you have to implement them in both somehow. It's going to be a tough call. Yeah, so that's probably not going to work. At least for us, it definitely doesn't. So what do we do now? A rewrite is obviously not an option. Yeah, continuing the way we had it obviously is not an option either. So we're doomed. Well, not, not quite. <laughs> <laughs> Um, that's one thing that we can do indeed, and for us the only real viable option was, okay, we try to do it piece by piece. So or feature by feature or however, we'll have a look at that. And this is essentially what we are going to talk about. Um, the overall vision that we have, like as a midterm vision, is to make the legacy system a pure backend system. That's actually a vital core part of the whole idea. Pretty much everybody, particular developers, which pretty much everybody in the room here probably is at some point, um, tend to like, okay, I have to replace this thing, and the sooner the better. And of course, that's a cool idea, but it's really hard to achieve, as we probably just established. So saying, okay, let's just remove everything that is actually annoying us, and at some point realize that the system is not really a problem anymore for us, then maybe it's not feasible to actually change that system or throw it away. Just keep it running if it's not actually too big of a bother until it becomes a bother again and then focus on the next step on that. So the focus is not replacing the legacy system per se. It's trying to avoid all the problems we had with it while having it isolated somewhere where it doesn't hurt. Yeah, so... In essence, we just don't want that like any customer-facing requests are handled by the legacy application directly. Yep. That's like the first big goal that we have. So 
Now, the next question, obviously, is where do we start with that? If we go piece by piece, like which piece would be the best one to start with, right? And the first thing that can come to mind is, okay, let's focus on the business impact that those different pieces have. So it yeah, seems like a good idea, at least. Let's ask the business people what they think is most important for us to work on first. Problem with that is that if you look at the whole application in general, it's a complex thing, obviously, based on the software. So we have various areas that are relatively tightly coupled. And we actually have to focus not necessarily only on the business impact, but what we can actually tackle to begin with. So the business impact might be a big pointer in the direction where we want to go, but it's actually only a pointer. It's not, this is the feature that we're going to replace per se. Maybe it happens to be the same thing, that would be awesome, but usually it's more like, okay, to actually tackle this particular area that the business considers the most interesting or most important, then we actually have to see, okay, what actually have we in small leaves around it? So if we see that as a tree, which is a very nice example, at least to me, is that the orange part, I hope that's actually visible as an orange, from, at least from here it is, um, that's the, obviously the core part of the tree, so you have the trunk and the branches. So that's the business processes, the things are actually happening. And of course, if you say, okay, I'm going to replace the core as in the middle trunk of it, obviously all the leaves will fall down because you just remove the vital core part of the system. So what you want to focus on is working on the leaves, so everything that's green. And by the time on a particular branch all the leaves got replaced, it's relatively easy to replace also the branch because the leaves are already independent. Yeah. So could be that like from a business perspective it makes sense to replace a certain feature but that feature is like one of the large branches i'm so proud of this animation and um if you cut off that branch um you'll see well all the leaves are dead now so you have again this huge complex thing with a lot of dependencies so that wouldn't work probably so logical thing to, to realize if you see that it would actually fail is, well, let's start with the leaves. And particular for Katmarai, I think that was quite beneficial because one of their main problems, at least back then, was the leaves. Yeah. So that fits. And uh, starting with the leaves um, pretty much means separate read from write. And in a more technical term, that would be CQRS. Yeah, the command query responsibility segregation, basically meaning exactly the separate reads from writes in a more layman's term, um, makes sure that we actually have areas of the application that are based on reading data. So it's all the standard GET requests, if you would speak HTTP. This is relatively easy to isolate because if that actually is reading from a database or from somewhere else, it doesn't really matter for the reading perspective. So it's something that you can easily update and replace by an alternative. Yeah. And um, we'll look at an actual example again now. So we're back to the e-commerce site, and this is one of the product detail pages with some random invitation card. And I mean, you see the usual elements, right? We have names and prices and different colors to choose from and an add to, let's call it add to basket button. There's a configuration step in between that doesn't matter for now. Um, bottom line is this whole product detail page is not really personalized, meaning the HTML that each browser receives when sending a request is identical every time. So one of the first things that um, we then came up with is that, well, we don't need to generate this HTML all the time. Um, we only need to generate it or re-render it when the data changes. So there's a new price, a new color, the name changes, stuff like that. And that also is already part of CQRS because the reading, like the request coming in, reading a product detail page, is separated from generating that page. It's also separated from modifying data. And the interesting, at least in this case, um, fact is that this particular page is something that is actually very expensive to generate in the legacy system, so it's relatively slow. So one of the core problems that were like, the motivation from the business perspective to actually start a rewrite or a re search for a replacement, let's put it that way, 
um, was to get rid of this penalty of waiting until this page is actually shown. So in this case, we are lucky that something that's relatively easy, at least from a technical perspective, to replace actually fits with the business goals as well. Yeah. And um, you will not focus on the implementation of that, but more on the well, infrastructure, uh, infrastructure setup that allowed us to um, replace the, let's call it reading part of the product detail pages um, and cut that out of our legacy system without really changing the data itself. So the product data is still sitting in the legacy system, but the whole, what we call front end as customer facing is completely separate from that. So, um, yeah very basic setup infrastructure wise. So, I mean, we always have this kind of web server running, no matter which one it is, and there's some legacy system. And now if we want to add a new system here that is able to handle requests, there are various options. And we have settled with um, this particular setup. So first of all, we add a new, and we still call it front end application here, which should handle requests. So ideally, the web server sends a request to the new front end. Front end says, yeah, I know that URL, I can serve that. Here's the response, everything's well. Since we only want to cut out um, certain parts of functionality, we will not be able to handle all the pages. Um, so uh, what do we do? We, send, we still send all requests to the new front end first. And the front end then can decide if this is a URL it is capable of serving or if it doesn't know anything about it. And then it just returns a 404. And then there's some logic in the web server that says, okay, then I will do a fallback to the legacy system and ask that if it maybe knows about this URL. And this is, we, we call it chain of responsibility and it's, very close to that. If you really look at the pattern itself, it's maybe not the yeah. by book implementation. The, by the book, you would actually have to have the new front end call the legacy system, basically proxy it. But since from an um, application perspective, that would only make this front end system do more work for no apparent reason. Um, we simply tell the web server to continue proxying to the next system. Yeah. And this is a very simple setup. I mean, there's like an Nginx, it's really. I don't know, two lines of additional configuration or something. Um, but it's extremely powerful because with a new deployment of your new front end, you can add more routes to it so it can serve more kinds of pages. And you don't have to touch the old system at all because it just behaves as it, as it did before. You don't have to touch the um, Nginx or web server configuration either yeah. because the decision logic is in the new front end. Yeah. And of course, that means you have a slight um, amount of overhead because every request goes to the new system first, and if that has a 404, then you have like another request going to the legacy system. In our case, that was completely fine for us because the sites that remained in the legacy system were slow anyway, so it didn't matter if it like added up 10 to 15 milliseconds uh, more. Yeah, of course, you want to have a fast routing decision in the new front end. If you have to wait for a couple of seconds for whatever big framework to bootstrap, that obviously is not an option. Yeah, so you can, of course, still move that logic into the web server. If you want it there, we decided to have the more flexibility on the um, new front end and without any updating of web server or legacy system to yeah. be able to change the routing. Which also enables us to do an A-B testing kind of thing because a route in the new front end might decide on certain request parameters or certain cookies or headers to be present. Um, and if it's not, then it will not um, handle the request. So you can say, okay, I have a new version of a certain site and it's already built into the new front end, but my regular customer should not see it. So they will still get the old one. But if I send a specific header, for example, then the route is activated and I end up in the new front end. So yeah, uh, that works really, really well for us. It's like the first thing we did to replace the whole front end part of category pages and product detail pages. So they are served by the new system. Um, yeah, so what do well, we do next? Well, we're actually quite far already. We have the first thing done. We have a very fast responsive site now. So obviously business like happy, okay, cool, that worked. Let's go to the next thing. And of course the question is, what might be the next thing? Yeah, and one logical conclusion could be, okay, we started with like the first pages the user will see when he comes to our site. 
so category pages, home page, and product detail page, what would be the next part in the user journey, and um, well, that would be hopefully the basket and uh, the checkout afterwards, right? Yeah. So yeah, let's focus on the basket. The basket, yeah. So um, we've already established this request handling thing. So for, for example, product URLs, we already go to the new front end. For basket URLs, or the one basket URL that we have for reading, uh, we have this set up right now, so the new front end doesn't know about it, and we go to the legacy system. Now, we want, of course, that also the basket page is completely handled by the new front end, and ideally, the legacy system is out of the game here. That would be great. But that might not be that easy to achieve. I mean, there's likely to be quite some technology in the legacy system that we do not want to touch yet, removing the tree with the trunk and the leaves and everything. So maybe we have to come up with a bit more of a complex solution. So simply doing the same thing, copying it over, probably doesn't work. Yeah. And again, we'll start focusing on the reading side. So we decided to leave the business logic as well as the whole persistence layer in the old application, for now at least, and really start with focusing on serving the basket page to the user through the new front end. So we still need the legacy system because all the data is in there. But uh, of course, we don't want to couple the new front end to the legacy system. So we really don't want it to talk to it directly and use some quirky old APIs. So what do we do? We add a service in the middle. Yeah, that's technically, if you want to have a pattern name again, called branch by abstraction. So we put something in between, abstract the original system away, and come up with our own API for it. Yeah, and in the, in the first phase, this service really only it provides a clean new API to the new front end. So the front end doesn't know that there is a legacy system sitting somewhere behind that. But all the um, changing calls that go here still end up here. So this is more like a, well, facade proxy kind of thing. But that allows us to establish the front end here so we can show a page to the user and show him his basket. Um, and the request does not go through the old system anymore, which is already quite cool. Now, the logical next step would be to make that service larger and add the business logic there. So we move out all the basket-related functionality into the new service so it gets its own persistence and business logic. So we don't need the old system anymore at all. That would be a good next step until you see that there is also a checkout. And sorry for the, I mean, it's a checkout. It's not very good looking. but. That's how checkouts are, right? Yeah. Um, so the problem is the checkout is still sitting in the legacy system. And of course, it has dependency, a dependency to the basket data. It makes sense. I mean, you want to pay for your basket. If you don't know what you want to pay for, that's a probably a bit complicated to deal with. Yeah. So it turn turns out, um, even if we move out the basket functionality into the new service, we still have to keep the legacy system in sync with that. And that doesn't sound too nice, because what does that mean? If we add new items to the basket, for example, we write to the basket service, which has its own representation of basket data, but that one still has to send a request to the legacy system updating its data as well. So the checkout still works. Which technically isn't necessarily a big problem, but of course it's an impact on the performance because we had of, at one piece decided, or at one part in our Journey decided that the legacy system should go away, and now we just coupled it with an additional layer in between back to our front end system. So, not too nice and probably slow. Yeah, and in our example, it, in our case, it really is slow. So, adding something to the basket in that system might take two to five seconds, depending on the product. So, the, it really has an impact. So, it doesn't really help us to have all the logic now in the new service, which might be blazingly fast, but if it still has to make this request to the old system, we don't gain much performance-wise. Now you can come up with different variations of that. Maybe you want to reverse the coupling so the service doesn't have to talk to the old application anymore, um, which could look like this. So if you go to the checkout, which ends up in the old system, you make a call to the service and like fetch the basket data and then put it in the old system so you have it for the checkout. 
but actually that doesn't help you much either because it's still the synchronous slow call that you need to do. It's even worse because if you make want to make this work based on the new arrow that we have from a legacy system to um, our basket service means that we actually have to change the legacy system now to actually make all that work. And one of our ideas was to get rid of the legacy system, not to actually enhance it. Yeah, so that doesn't work either. Um, now you might come to, come to the conclusion, okay, those synchronous calls are not really helping us. This is not what we want. So maybe we want to have events there. I mean, everybody likes events today, right? I mean, this is like the big thing. Everything has to be event-based, so why not go for it? Yeah. And we can easily build that. So we have like a basket request, we have a write to the service, and now the service sends update events to some event store. And we add some small event handler thingy that grabs the events and sends data into the legacy system. And well, the cool thing about that is that this is asynchronous now, right? Yeah, well, that's perfect because we don't have any synchronous calls to the legacy system anymore. So cool. So we win. Or yeah. do we? <laughs> Not quite yet. So um, we still have an issue with this performance thing because this is potentially pretty fast. This is still slow. So updating the legacy system might take a lot longer than the user needs to uh, click on the go to checkout button on his page because this is already done. This is handled. So he sees his updated basket and he can go directly to checkout. And maybe the legacy system isn't ready for that yet because maybe not all events have been processed. Which is by definition a feature of working with events because by definition they are eventually consistent. <laughs> Where did that pun come from? <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so maybe events aren't that great after all and they don't really help us. Well, maybe they are just at the wrong spot. So maybe we just have to rethink what we actually just did and where we lost our path. If we recall how the tree stuff works, the checkout obviously is business logic and we just started to replace um, a trunk or a branch, depending on how you want to see it, um, and ignoring that there are still leaves that we didn't cover. So to actually make this whole thing work, we have to remember that we still have leaves that are dangling there, and we have to replace the leaves first. Yeah. So we'll go a step back and uh, whoops, and go back to the basket service that is really just doing the abstraction of the legacy system for us. So we still have the coupling to the legacy system. All the basket data sits in here, and this is just for the API. Um, what we can do now is actually replace the checkout first, because the checkout has a read dependency on the basket. It needs the basket data. So we can start with this. So the main difference is just that we didn't remove the arrow from basket service to legacy system just yet. Yeah, so now we have two services which both still talk to the legacy system. So still all the data and business logic is sitting here. Um, but we have the front end part covered already. So the request is handled completely by the new front end, which uses nice clean APIs towards those two ser services. And now I can go the next step and make actually the checkout service complete first by moving all the logic over um, because there I don't have those dependencies anymore. So I can use the basket data that this front end read from the basket service and then hands it over to the checkout service. Because yeah. Don't make the mistake <laughs> that have the, have the checkout service ask the basket service for details. That's going to be cross dependencies and you don't want to go there. Yeah. That's the dependency hell, the other hell you don't want to be in. And of course, it's not quite true that this doesn't have any dependencies anymore because most likely you have follow-up processes running in the legacy system that, I don't know, sends mails out, um, does requests to payment providers, maybe sends orders to another internal system. So all of that. And maybe you don't want to or cannot replace that all in once and you don't want to put it in here. So there's still something that we need to do. Um, but here the events can actually help because if the checkout process itself is covered, the user places his order and is done in the browser. Like 
confirmation page. Thank you very much. That's it. And now we can send an actual event to the event store saying, hey, an order was placed. And now the event handler can pick that up and put it into the legacy system. And we don't really care how long that takes. Like, it can take a couple of seconds, maybe even minutes. That's not too bad because the user already is finished with his process. And it might take a little longer until he gets his confirmation mail, but that is not too bad. So here, these, this eventual consistency is completely fine for us. Now that we have it isolated, we can cut more lines. Yeah. Now we can move over the basket functionality because we don't have any more dependencies to the legacy system. And at least for this scenario, of course, that is not complete. But here we have actually achieved the goal we had in the beginning to make this a backend system because it doesn't like respond to any requests anymore. Yeah. So the customer only interacts with our new front end. Of course, there are additional potentially internal processes that still use and require the legacy system, hence the link from the event store with the event handler to get the data back in there. But that's completely decoupled. So if you want to work on additional areas, so you can do exactly the same thing all over again. Yeah. So we have our main first couple of things that were impacts to the business solved and fixed that into individual, well, in this case, services linked to a new front end system that took over step by step. Yeah, so we already achieved quite a lot. Of course, the question is, what do we do after that? And I mean, it's pretty much back to this, right? So we have cut off one of the branches now, but there are quite a lot left. Yeah, well, now we have to find the next branch to focus on and do exactly the same thing all over again. And at some point, there's only be the core trunk left. And if that's the only thing that's actually left, you can realize that you don't even need the core anymore because obviously this is only an inter, um, interconnecting thing right now because you only need it to actually send stuff around. Nobody actually uses it anymore. Yeah. And the cool thing about this, as much effort as it may be to like identify those branches and cover them independently, because in the beginning you will end up having like a plan of what you want to replace, but then realize, oh, that doesn't work because there's other stuff depending on that. But if you have figured out a way how to cut off those branches, um, the rest of the ecosystem keeps intact. So you can add another feature in there meanwhile. And also if you get the new stuff out way earlier, because maybe the front end part only took you, let's say three months instead of a year for the, for the rewrite, then you can start adding new features there as well. So you're much more agile and um, the business will like that. Okay, um, time for conclusion. So our actual escape plan, and of course also we are not finished yet, <laughs> we're in the middle of that, um, Yeah, contains a couple of patterns and methods that really help us there. Yeah, the chain of responsibility, making sure that you have easy means of um, determining who's going to be responsible for a certain route. Using CQS as in separating reads and writes, so actually starting with the leaves, having projections, if you want to go in the event sourcing way um, of terminology. This is stuff that I'm going to deliver. I'm not actually going to request it completely from a database and build up everything from scratch again, but just have, well, projections ready to deliver. Yeah, branch by abstraction. Having intermediate system decouple the legacy system from the new front end, because if you don't do that, you're just going to add on top of the legacy system. That's not going to help you. You actually have to decouple it and have it abstracted away. And yes, of course, use events because they help decoupling. But of course, keep in mind to do that at the right point in time, because otherwise you're going to make things worse, not better. I think if you manage to follow those things and actually really do that step by step, at some point in time, I guess we can. <sighs> consider us escaped. Yeah, it's actually a pretty long quest. Uh, we're good on the way. And yeah, if you manage to, to follow those um, concepts, you'll most likely also be able to escape legacy hell. And 
earn this nice little badge. Uh, you can also cheat and approach us and we'll give it to you for free. <laughs> and that would conclude our escape from Legacy Hell. So thank you very much. I guess it's time for questions, in case there are questions. Let's just start in the front. Just curious, will the uh, checkout um, component that you built, how did you manage to get the user data out of the legacy? Because with checkout, you probably need some sort of user data. Mm -hmm. And in my experience, user data is kind of coupled everywhere. So I, I would be curious how you handled that scale of getting some user data, maybe moving it to the checkout, or maybe not? So, um, maybe just to repeat it for everybody? Oh yeah, thank you, yeah, I <laughs> forgot about that. So the question was, uh, what about user data, especially considering checkout? You probably need some customer information, and that is usually spread around the system because you have a lot of places where you need that. So, um, first of all, you could pretty easily build some customer service thing that in the beginning does the same as we did with basket and checkout, so you read from the legacy system, so you keep the data in there. That can also contain um, or include sessions. So in the front end thing for the um, category and product pages, for example, we just reuse the session that the legacy system has for us. At least in the beginning we did that, uh, because we didn't have any page that changed session data. So if you add something to basket, it went to the legacy system, so the session would be updated there. So that worked quite well for us. Um, yeah, and if you have a, a reading customer service, then you could already implement the um, checkout. Because if you need to change customer data, that can be handled by, well, sending a request to the customer service saying, hey, in checkout, he changed his delivery address, or there's a new delivery address. So it, it pretty much works the same as those two examples we had here, I would say. Yeah? Right there? I would say that's your topic. <laughs> yeah, it's actually it's a bit of a, a mean question, but it makes sense anyway. So the idea, question was, just to repeat it as well, um, if we had an idea of the target architecture. Um, I would probably be lying if I would say yes completely, but of course I had a general idea where I would want to um, lead everybody to. So the general idea of particular using CQS and having like services coupled, that was already plan of it. What service would actually exist and what their responsibilities would be, of course that would be to be defined on the way. Because you, if you, particularly as a consultant, come into a company, you have a general idea what the business might be about, that may be completely off once you talk to people. But um, in general, that gets your idea, OK, this is where the problems are, and this is a potential architecture that might help, well, not necessarily taking all the problems away, but at least make things a lot easier and more smooth. So we had the general idea of CQS, and at some points getting events and services in between. So that general concept, yes, the exact implementation, how it's structured right now, this came while we were working on it. How long did you Okay, so the question was how long did it actually take us to do this, what we showed you? And uh, the second part, if it would be still be a valid um, way to go if it took longer. Um, well, if it, so first of all, um, I would say the three months for developing the front end thing is not, it's relatively close. We have to say though, um, and that is kind of a benefit, um, we also used it to change requirements because we re rethought the whole like how do we want to deal with category pages and product detail pages we did a rebrush so new uh, design and everything so overall until we had the first job launched it took longer half a year a little bit less i think uh, close, something yeah. around that um so that worked quite well um if it took longer than that i would say the scope would be too big for it so then it would probably make sense to try to cut it in smaller chunks if possible. Um, the interesting thing is what 
in this case, cut and write, try to do is obviously rebrush the whole thing. So the, basically, the whole user experience is like one design. But if you check, for example, the Deutsche Bahn website, you sometimes, if you click through the buying process, the design changes because they only focus on one certain area that they actually were working on. And you could, of course, say that's pretty much what he just said, like the scope was too big, don't do everything at once, make it smaller. If the leaf is too big, well, maybe you find interleaves in there saying, okay, this is just a tiny fraction that we want to change. Maybe you just have to replace one button which opens a pop-up and this is the new thing. It's really, okay, finding a thing that is small enough to start with and obviously has at least some business value so that you can actually work on that particular area. <laughs> so I don't think there's a, it took too long in general. I mean, obviously, if you decide this is not the way you can continue working, we have to find a way out. Trying to do everything at once is hardly ever going to work. I mean, there are cases where it probably worked, but that probably means that it was a very small project to begin with, at least I would assume so. So if you have a large thing that is actually working for many users, many customers, then you probably have to start with a small thing. And finding the smallest thing that actually makes sense might, of course, be part of the process, finding out where to start. Yeah, and that can be really hard. I mean, this is like one of the systems that we try to replace now. There's more hidden beneath that <laughs> that the customer never sees anyway, which is the whole card rendering thing. So we need to create print data and send it to the printing company. That's also a bunch of legacy systems. They are all somehow talking to each other over no, well, not really APIs, but sometimes it's shared file system, sometimes it's an HTTP request, sometimes it's some remote command execution. And in, in that situation, finding something, okay, where can I go in and cut one thing out without like breaking everything around that is extremely hard. And it takes a lot of planning and it's kind of frustrating, but it works. And if you figured out which parts to replace, then it becomes really rewarding to do that. Yeah. Another approach, basically following the same pattern, um, is to say we're not going to replace anything, particularly in the rendering thing, but for just one certain type of product, we just make a new thing, and everything else goes to the old system. So we are basically back to finding a small thing. More questions? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so the basic technology stack is PHP. Um, the legacy system, I think, at least from the thing that the users would somehow interact with, is a Magento, which is patched to extremes. <laughs> so I'm not sure if you can still call it Magento. Um, the new system also is PHP. Um, obviously, newer versions, but still PHP. Um, the, well, we use Nginx, use Redis to store the pre rendered, pre generated things in. So, yeah, the front-end system doesn't actually know what MySQL is because it doesn't need any databases. Yeah, and we decided to settle for boring technology <laughs> and it works quite well for us. Yes, please. Yeah, okay, so how would you degrade the legacy system to a backend system if it doesn't have any kind of API <laughs> that you could use. Uh, we experienced that problem. I mean, Magento does have some sorts of APIs to it. And um, you can also use the regular HTTP calls that maybe normally the front end does. That kind of works. Um, but yes, we couldn't really get around um, not touching the system at all. So maybe you do have to add some sort of API or some way to access data and manipulate it. So depending on the system you have to replace, there might be some work ahead there as well, yes. What you could also, it's arguable whether that is touching the legacy system is if you write software that just reads from the legacy database. Obviously that would be trying to understand how the data is structured, so you're probably taking some of the um, promises of the application away that it's gonna hide certain things from you. But you can of course query the original database that is obviously not something that you want to do forever, so this is definitely on the way when you want to um, well, replace it at some point. But since you, as one of the main decisions, said you're not going to touch the legacy system anymore, so there are not going to be major changes, the schema is not going to change either. So you are potentially in a situation where you can write different queries that may be even more optimized for what you actually try to achieve here and just get the data you need. Yes. 
Um, that's an integration part on the front end. So if that is routing it, it's going to have the basket data. It actually doesn't really have to query the information from the basket service every time because that's part of the session because from a logical perspective, the thing will only change once when you add something or modify items in the basket. So you can have a projection in the session so it's available to the front end process and it just has to pass it on as part of the payload to the next service. All right. Okay, I guess that's it for now. Thank you very much for coming. If you, you have more questions, feel free to approach us. Thank you.